we just continue to urge every American to put into practice the president's coronavirus guidelines. It's working, America. And it's working because you're doing it. And we encourage you onward in that. You just heard him. It's working, America. Vice President Mike Pence sending a message of hope as coronavirus cases here in the United States have topped 466,000, Ainsley. Yes, yeah, Steve, the, the data is showing progress in some of the nation's hardest hit areas. New York, the epicenter, seeing 200 new hospitalizations on Wednesday. That's 1,200 less than the previous average, Brian. Oh, those are, those are great numbers. This, despite New York uh, becoming the epicenter of the world, will remain so, has cases near 162,000. That's almost 9,000 more cases than Spain, the country with the second highest amount of patients. Hi, everybody. It's going to be a huge show when you see our, our roster of guests especially. Uh, what I noticed, too, is a lot of the models uh, that just uh, used the numbers that they were given uh, projected a lot of things more severely than it actually turned out. For example, in California, they've done an extraordinary job to date. They thought they were going to have 4,800 beds needed. They actually only needed 2,200. In Louisiana, they said, uh-oh, we're going to need 6,400 beds. Right now, they only need 1,700. And for New York, as you know, Governor Cuomo constantly saying he needs more beds. He says they've used only 15,000 beds. The projection was 58,000. So continue to do what we're doing because the numbers and the models are going in the right direction, Steve. That's right, Brian. And, you know, when people uh, the, the, during the show today, we're going to talk about how some uh, inside the administration have said, you know, cracking down and closing the uh, entire country essentially for at least a month was an overreaction. But when you look at how the models are now being turned downward, that's a good thing. You know what that says? That doesn't that says to me that what we're doing is working and the United States has rallied together in this time of need and we've figured out how to save lives. That that lower estimate just is a, a re, an affirmation that we have saved perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives because we are social distancing and we do it every day. And that's one of the reasons we are in three different studios right now. Uh, coming up on the program today, we're, we know you've got questions. We've got Dr. Mark Siegel. We've got Dr. Nicole Sapphire. We've got Dr. Oz. Also, we've got General Jack Keane. We've got Secretary Eugene Scalia. And because it is Good Friday, Timothy Cardinal Dolan. If you have a question for him, email us friends at foxnews.times. These are trying times, and he will address America's spirit. Uh, or you could uh, find us on Facebook. Also, America Together, a Fox and Friends living room concert with country superstar Lee Bryce. He's got something real special, Ainsley, for us. Coming up at 8:45 this morning. His music is incredible, and he's been a friend of the show for a long time. He wrote a new song that is something that you need to wait around for because it is worth it. We also um, have a big lineup, as you said. Today is Good Friday. Easter is on Sunday, and that's supposed to be the big peak for deaths. However, that does usually lag behind the number of hospital visits. The good news is, as you were saying, Brian, the hospital visits are down across our country, showing signs that we are all following the rules. So good for you, America. Uh, an encouraging message for Americans workers, President Trump promising that the United States will recover from the coronavirus pandemic. Listen. We have tremendous stimulus. We have tremendous stimulus plans. We're going to have a big bounce rather than a small bounce. But we will be back. Unfortunately, that bounce back could be months away. The mitigation efforts uh, seem to be bearing fruit. The numbers are enormously improved. Let us hope we can reopen this economy in the next four to eight weeks. Yeah, we got to start uh, doing what we're doing and at some time get a plan to stand up the economy again. From coast to coast, the pressure is mounting to provide relief, though, for struggling Americans who have been told to go home and stop working. Lawmakers ramping up talks with Secretary Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, as Democrats out of nowhere shoot down funding for small business. I didn't know small business was a Democrat or Republican thing, Steve. Meanwhile, Brian, the president is expediting help to farmers that provide our nation's food, tweeting, quote, I expect Secretary Perdue to use all of the funds and authorities at his disposal to make sure that our food supply is stable, strong and safe. 
we will always be there for our great farmers, cattlemen, ranchers, and producers. So that's where we are right now. Let's bring in our first guest of the day, former ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, and former South Carolina governor as well. Governor, ambassador, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, guys. You there's a uh, there's a story out in the uh, New York, rather the Washington Post, that says the president wants to reopen the country for business activity on May 1st, uh, when the federal social distancing guidelines end. But the question is, how do you do it? Where do you do it? And as Stephen Moore, one of the president's advisors, said, Ambassador, uh, Donald Trump's presidency depends on getting this right, because essentially we don't want to go over the hump and then have another hump. Yet the last thing you want is two peaks. So what do you think we do? I think the president and the administration are doing things right. What you want to do is make sure that the health and safety of people is number one. But you also want to have a second track where you're working on the economy. And that means that you keep going in the direction you're going with health and safety. And when we get to April 30th, then go and evaluate you know, have we re reached the benchmarks that we want to and what do we need to do to open businesses? I mean, the reality is you've got a lot of people who've already tested positive, who've already gone through it. Are we getting them to donate their plasma? That should be the first thing. The second thing is, where are we in the testing? Where are the hot spots? And what can we start to open up? And so I think to do this in a smart way, you have to have a health track and you have to have an economic track. And I think both of those can move at the same time, but each is dependent on the other. And so it will depend April 30th on where both of those stand. But I think he's smart to be looking at both of them at the same time. Ambassador, uh, Mitch McConnell is trying to get more money for small businesses because that Paycheck Protection Program, they're going to run out of money. So many of these small businesses are going to the banks. Banks are saying they are overloaded with paperwork. They need more money, but that didn't pass yesterday in the Senate. Democrats did not like the Republican bill. Um, so here's the president talking about how our lawmakers need to work together. with Congress to replenish the very successful, incredibly successful, the way it's going, Paycheck Protection Program, which is allowing hundreds of thousands of small businesses to keep their workers on the payroll, meaning it'll keep those businesses open. We need both Democrats and Republicans to come together to get this legis the legislation completed. And it looks like it's uh, on its way, but we need both. And it should be for people that are working for the workers. So uh, Mitch McConnell said that his colleagues are treating the American worker as political hostages and they're playing games with a crisis. What's your message to the Democrats? Well, I think bottom line is there's no reason that they couldn't have passed Mitch McConnell's bill. It would help small businesses. It would help workers. If they have something else they want to do, go ahead and pass that when you get your support and when you get the ideas to do that. But we need to get this program done. You've got small businesses. They typically don't have 45 days worth of reserves there. They've got people who have been loyal and worked for them that they want to keep and they can only do it with this program. And so now's not the time to be playing games. Now's time to get money in the hands of those that want to keep employing people, want to keep their businesses open. And while you know, you've got members of Congress fighting over this, there is no time to waste if you have a small business. They need the money now. All right. Uh, as you know, there's very few people with more international experience than you, especially your governor. And you got this experience and you also know this administration. Now, there's a big push now as people starting to look around and say, how did this happen? What did the WHO do? There's a Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, uh, subcommittee, and they're calling for the WHO chief. I don't know if you've met him or not to resign. After all, what he said in March, that China's done a wonderful job in containing this and uh, was uh, trying to, to uh, uh, rebuke the president for putting in the Chinese travel ban, for him not acknowledging the existence of Taiwan. Do you think it's time for this guy to, uh, to resign? He came back at us and said, if you don't want more body bags, stop pol uh, politicizing this. What do you think, Governor? I think, I think Senator Risch um, has it right. He wants to do a full investigation. I mean, look at the timeline. You've got December 30th, Taiwan goes and tells the WHO, we believe and have evidence that there's human to human transmission. Then you have January 14th, 
The head of the WHO, Tedros, says we don't see any evidence of human to human transmission. Then you go a week later and they have an emergency meeting to decide if this is an international crisis. They don't make a decision on that day. Instead, Tedros travels to China to go meet with them. It is a week later when he comes back and says, they decide, okay, this could be an emergency, but you don't need to limit travel and you don't need to limit trade. Yet the president does it anyway, and Tedros criticizes him for doing that. The American people have every right to ask the WHO questions. The American people deserve to know why Taiwan was ignored and China was listened to. Those are real questions that we need real answers. And the idea that he went back after the president and said, you know, do you want to see more body bags? I have dealt with those guys at the UN for a long time. That's what they do. They turn the tables whenever they're criticized and they have to be held accountable just like we would hold any American agency accountable. This was a world pandemic that they could have stopped as soon as a month prior. We pay 22% of the WHO doesn't mean who pays the most gets what they want, but it does mean that we deserve answers and we deserve to hold them accountable. And he's got a lot of questions to answer right now. No kidding. If we had just known so much more ahead of time, we might be in a different spot right now. Meanwhile, uh, in the pages of the New York Times, uh, which a lot of people aren't picking up, they're actually reading online. You've got an op ed and it is uh, the headline is you say focus on your governor, not Trump. What are you saying, former governor? Well, what I said in, in the op-ed is I say, of course, the president has to manage the federal response. That's what a president does. But once he pushes that aid out, then it is up to the governors. The governors have to know what's in their warehouses. They have to know how to distribute it to the people. They have to know where the hot spots are. They typically know the vulnerabilities. They know their hospitals. They know their mayors. They know how to coordinate. You've seen governors on both sides of the aisle really shine through this process. And then you've seen some governors who have actually been um, somewhat complaining and not sure what to do and you know it's just talking about the way that government was intended to run when i was governor and we knew a crisis was coming we developed those relationships with the feds we warned them of what we were going to need where our vulnerabilities were going to be when the crisis hit us the feds sent it down and we were in charge of distributing it so this is the time now where the governors are center stage and the states that are doing well those governors are going to be praised for it and the states that aren't doing well those governors need to learn from those mistakes and make sure that when this happens again they're prepared you and your husband have served my great state, South Carolina, as you know, where I was born and where my family still lives. And we thank you so much for your service. Your husband is in the National Guard in South Carolina. Tell the folks at home the news about what he's about to go and do. Well, he was activated about a week ago, along with um, other members of the military to help in the COVID crisis. And, you know, it's amazing. Um, you know, he was deployed in Afghanistan. Now he's deployed to help with COVID-19. And they are working to coordinate with hospitals to make sure that they have the beds available, to make sure that if they need extra space, it is happening. Um, it is once again where the great men and women of the military are stepping up to do whatever is needed um, for their country. And this is what they do. They wait for the call. And when the call comes, no complaining, no questions. They get up and they do it. We're real proud of him. Governor, uh, now in the president of the United States, he's got approval ratings at 49 percent. It's as high as it's been in this very polarized country. When it comes to these five o'clock press conferences, some even on the right are saying, hey, Mr. President, run them, but get out, uh, end them quick quicker because it ends up being so personal with him and the press. Where do you stand on that? Well, I think anytime there's a crisis, a leader needs to do two things. One, they need to over communicate, which he clearly is doing. And the second thing is they need to be able to show vision of what it's going to look like on the other side of the crisis. And I think that the president is good to show up every day and let people know he's on it. But I also think he needs to let his experts speak. Let them 
them talk about it. I think he should go and set the tone. I think he should let them put out the data. I think they should answer any questions that the press has, and then they should leave. I don't think they need to be too long. I don't think he needs to feel like he has to answer everything. But I do think we need to hold um, you know, his members of the task force accountable. I think what would be really good is for him to have a health report, but also have an economic report at the same time. Now we're going to start to see both of those at the same time. Um, but I think that there's a reason he's got a 49% approval rating. I think people feel comfortable that his task force knows what he's doing. I think the vice president has done a great job leading that. I think the president has done a great job with the tone and putting priorities in place. And now we just have to continue to pray for, for all of them that they continue to lead and get us through this. All right, uh, Governor, Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us from Kiowa Island down in South yeah. Carolina. If you got to be anywhere, that is just a, a little slice of be. paradise. It's a it's lovely place to be, indeed. All right, thank, thank you, you very much for joining us live. All right. Meanwhile, 615 here in the East, Attorney General Bill Barr has a stern message for critics who say we should not be focused or that during this period, the cartels are not taking advantage of the United States. Yeah, that's 10,000 more than this uh, current, uh, current crisis would uh, kill in terms of Americans. Meanwhile, the administration's attention to stopping the flow of drugs across our border uh, continues while also combating the spread of the coronavirus. Here to discuss that, Acting CBP Commissioner Mark Morton. Mark, what could you tell us is happening with these drug cartels? Have they stopped trafficking because we have a corona crisis? No. And, and, and Brian, I, I mean, thanks for bringing this to the attention of the American people. I mean, anybody that criticizes uh, this attorney general right now for attacking a significant threat that that plagues this country and will continue, it, it's just ridiculous. I mean, what's the next criticism that he shouldn't focus on terrorism? As he said, last year, 70,000 people in this country died because of drugs at the hands of these disgusting, despicable cartels. So, yeah, we should absolutely continue to focus on that. And as the attorney general said, the hallmark of DOJ and law enforcement like CBP, we can focus on more than one threat at a time. If you look at last May, uh, March, uh, more people died because of drug over overdoses than the coronavirus. We need to keep this in perspective. Right, especially when people go through stress, that's when if you have a drug problem, you usually go to that again. And with this drugs um, readily available, it makes things worse. Mark, give us an idea what's happening at the border. With this crisis, we basically closed the border. Give us an idea what it was like in 2019 as opposed to 2020. Uh, who's being held in our facilities? Well, Brian, you're, you're spot on, and, and that's what the American people need to understand. First of all, th this president is taking aggressive containment and mitigation strategies, but he's doing so reasonably. So, so the border is still open to commercial trade and travel. That's very important. That hasn't been closed off. But what has been closed off are people that are trying to Ill enter this country illegally that haven't been vetted. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they've traveled or they come from. That's directly related to COVID-19. And as you said, last May, keep this in perspective, we were receiving 144,000 a month. That's over 35,000 per week. And back then, our facilities were overwhelmed. These people, we were releasing them into the shelters, into faith-based organizations, and into the interior of the United States. Can you imagine if we had that flow right now in the middle of this global pandemic? Back then, last May, CBP, we had over 20,000 individuals in our custody. I checked the data right before I walked in to talk to you guys. We had less than 100. That is unbelievable. So that's a direct result of this president's containment and mitigation strategies. That is hundreds of thousands of less people that are being released in the United States during this global pandemic. And Mark, you told me something astounding in the break. Most of them are Mexicans, unlike the situation a year ago. So they go right back to their other countries. In Central America or those triangle countries, they have gotten a hold of their situation, it seems. So have you guys restored the aid to those countries? Yes, we have. Uh, the, the president actually did that a few months ago because they really had stepped up as true partners in the last nine or 10 months to really help stem the flow. And you're exactly right. Last May, you know, 65, 70 percent were actually coming from the Northern Triangle countries, families. That has changed. And a lot of that was because of Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries. But what we saw then is it shifted then from the majority of coming from the Northern Triangle country to now the majority are actually Mexican nationals. And we're still seeing that now, even though, uh, 
ever since we, we, we instituted these travel restrictions, we've seen the flow just the past few weeks drop by 50 percent of those trying to illegally wow. enter. Uh, but the majority are, are still Mexicans. Can you believe that the border under control, even under these dire circumstances? Mark Morgan, thanks so much. You bet. Thank you. All right. You got it. Meanwhile, it's a somber scene. Churches across the country empty on Good Friday. Millions of Americans and Christians around the world prepare to celebrate Easter Sunday at home. Well, as churches remain closed across the nation on this Good Friday, President Trump is asking Americans to use this time to pray and reflect. We're going to have many Easter's together in churches in the future. While we may be physically apart, we can use this time to pray, to reflect, and to focus on our personal relationship with God. Theologian and Fox News contributor Jonathan Morris joins me now with how we can all celebrate our faith while we stay at home. Good morning, Jonathan. Uh, good morning, Ainsley. Good morning. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, th these, go ahead. these are such somber times, but you know, it's Good Friday, and uh, Good Friday is supposed to be pretty somber, right? I remember growing up, I don't know if you had this tradition, you're home um, Ainsley, but my parents would try to keep us kids quiet from 12 o'clock p.m. until 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock p.m., like those hours where Jesus hung on the cross before he died, that was hard to do. But now we're all living it in, in isolation um, and with fear and anxiety, those feelings that Jesus had as he was going to the cross. Wow, what a great tradition. I'm going to start that with Hayden. Thank you for that idea. Mm -hmm. You have good parents. I know, you know, we used to go to <laughs> church on Maundy Thursday and then Good Friday. We do a foot washing ceremony in our church in New York. Um, so many services are can't every service pretty much is canceled yeah. um you hear yeah. a few that are staying open and there's controversy there but on easter sunday how can we celebrate what do you recommend we do with our families well uh, there's no Easter Sunday if there's not a Good Friday, right? And we're so, we all want miracles, right? We all love the miracle of the resurrection, Easter Sunday. But that doesn't make sense if there wasn't suffering first. And we're so used to saying, uh, we, we would like the miracle of no suffering. But if we look in the Bible, there's no miracles without, uh, without going through a process. Like we even think about the multiplication of the loaves, right? Something very, something we all know. Jesus first went and took the little that they had, the two fish, the five loaves, and then he multiplied them over and over again. And the biggest miracle of Easter Sunday was a process, the worst process. You know, it was it was him being Jesus being arrested, Jesus suffering, being crowned with thorns. During this time, I think it's time for us to walk through the process of a miracle. Doing things very simple, I, I, I think is very important of getting up out of bed, making your bed, getting dressed even if you don't have any place to go, making a to-do list, making another to-do list of what we're gonna do for other people, doing exercise, and then of course praying. And, we, and th this year may be like no other year we're able to pray in solitude and quiet. Um, and I think it could be a, a, the best uh, Good Friday and Tritium and Easter Sunday that we've ever had. You know, I was watching Passion of the Christ recently. You can't even watch that movie without wow. just sobbing because you, the oh, man yeah. we love the most, went through so much for all of us. Um, and it's ironic that the peak of number of deaths in our country is supposed to hit on Easter. What do you make of that? Yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought about this before until you just said it, but Easter is about resurrection. And because of the cross, because of Jesus' death, our death is also resurrection. We have the chance to say, yes, I want the love of God in my life. Yes, I want to accept God in my life. Yes, I want his redemption. So as sad as it is, as tragic as it is, for Christians, we believe in the resurrection from the dead and so i think if we uh, if we work through this process of of these holy days um we will be able to see not only light at the end of the tunnel but great hope and joy even at the end of our lives yes and most churches are having services right i mean i, I know so many of my friends are sending me their sermons yeah. um a lot of people go to your Go to your websites and um, your church websites, and you can usually stream live and watch the, the minister or the priest um, yeah. praying and delivering a service. Are you doing something like that? 
Yeah, well, I'm doing I'm doing it on my my own Facebook page um, and Instagram, but I'm also following other people, right? And following, this is a time where we can either get bitter or better. It's like we have a choice to make. Um, it's so easy when there are churches were all all open to say, ah, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't right. go. I mean, the last 20 years, the United States, the, the church attendance has gone down so much, Ainsley, as you know. Um, mm-hmm. And I think this is a time where we can say, oh, wow, everything is closed. I better figure out what the answers to life are. I better look for it. I better find inspiration. Mm -hmm. Well, put on your Sunday best or watch a service (laughs) in your pajamas. Thank you so much. Happy Easter to you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's 633 here on the East Coast. It is a vital mission close to the heart of those on the front lines, including this Navy corpsman. I'm stationed here on the USNS Comfort. I work here in the ER. It's now offering free delivery for all orders through our app and these third-party partners. Jersey Mike's. Be a sub above. All right, it's your America Together shot of the morning, a patriotic show of support for healthcare workers outside two Connecticut hospitals. Hanging a 50-foot American flag from a crane with a sign that reads, thank you, some hospital workers waving back while wiping away their tears. And the CEO of J&K Tree Service first visited the hospital where his sister is an ICU nurse. He and his eight-year-old niece wanted to show staff how much they are appreciated. And that says it in a big way, in a red, white, and blue way. For more inspiring stories like this, head to foxnews.com slash America together. All right, welcome aboard folks. Uh, Joining us right now from about 40 miles south of me in Jersey, Pete Hegseth, Fox and Friends Weekend co-host and author of the upcoming book, American Crusade. Pete, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. I wish I could have a flag that size outside my house. I tried, but it's outside of code. (laughs) Well, I saw the cover of your new book. You're carrying one almost that big. Uh, more on that later. <laughs> but, but Pete, uh, you know, you know, in Washington, it's all about politics. Uh, yesterday, yeah. uh, Mitch McConnell and the Republicans were trying to get through another quarter of a trillion dollar increase in the Paycheck Protection Program uh, for small businesses. But the Democrats objected. They would like to see half of it go to smaller community-based banks. Just about. Uh, 15 minutes ago, we had Nikki Haley on. She took a look at what's going on in D.C. and had this message about what's happening. Watch. We need to get this program done. You've got small businesses. They typically don't have 45 days worth of reserves there. They've got people who have been loyal and worked for them that they want to keep, and they can only do it with this program. And so now's not the time to be playing games. Now's time to get money in the hands of those that want to keep employing people, want to keep their businesses open. And while you know, you've got members of Congress fighting over this, there is no time to waste if you have a small business. They need the money now. They do need the money now, Pete. But here's the thing. After it goes through the Senate, then Nancy Pelosi and the House will do something. So even at this time of crisis, there are politics involved. Well, yeah, and we saw with the two trillion dollar bill, the Democrats want to add their wish list to this. And, you know, no emergency can't let a crisis go to waste. I think I talked to a number of small business owners yesterday over the phone and they're they're trying to work through their banks to get access to this loans. A lot of the money hasn't been released yet, but they're confident it will be. But they're also worried that it may run out. So this is in the back of the minds of people who do not want to furlough or lay off more workers passionately. And they and they want to do right by their people in this truly man-made economic crisis. So Democrats better be careful here, because if you're going to play political games and try to make it about something else, pretty soon the the American people see through that. I think Mitch McConnell was very smart to say, let's bring this 250 uh, 2.0 small business bill forward because it's it's narrowly tailored to the people that need it the most. And if Nancy Pelosi wants to play games with it, I think the president uh, and, and Mitch McConnell and others should be adamant about the fact that this is exactly what we need targeted to the people that need it. Uh, and yes, we have a federalist system where the states have a lot of control, and that's the way it should be. And I love how the president has handled it that way. But when it comes to federal dollars, states are, are, are beholden to the, to the federal government. So I, I, I support uh, Nikki Haley's message here. They got to they gotta get out of the way and do it right. Right. 
It's unbelievable. Small business is not a Democrat or Republican thing. Small business exactly. is everybody agreed they need to be bailed out. They just didn't have enough money there. And instead, they started jamming in all types of other things instead of just doing a quick fix. Uh, it is so tone deaf. And I just of uh, getting that money, making that argument and start getting politics out of it. Meanwhile, uh, there's no politics involved with those USNS ships, the Comfort and Mercy, one in uh, California, one in New York, and one hospital corpsman uh, who was very emotional and talking about what it means to be deployed in New York City. Let's watch. This mission has been really special to me. Um, my uncle actually responded to 9-11 with the Comfort. Um, he was a firefighter in the Army at the time. and. Having this opportunity to be here and follow in his footsteps, someone that is the motivation for me joining the military, it's going to be pretty awesome. And now they're t starting to take coronavirus patients and helping out uh, a lot, Pete. A lot of people like you joined after 9-11. Yeah, uh, here's here's what I think hits her so deeply, and, and to me too, in seeing that video. We spent two decades after 9-11 fighting in other people's countries. Uh, and yes, we were doing it to defend our own. There's no doubt about that. But when you're over there, sometimes the connection is less, uh, it, it's less tangible because you're in someone else's village or community. Here she is in her own backyard here in New York City in America. Um, wearing our nation's uniform, helping citizens of this country. Uh, I can, I, it, it, we often thought about that overseas, thinking what if I was in my neighborhood or in my state defending my state from a foreign foe, or in this case from a virus, it adds a whole nother level of why you're in it and why you serve. So, it, you know, clearly service is in uh, this Corman's DNA. God bless her. 